Good afternoon or good morning, everybody. Be very welcome uh, uh, to our Knowledge Culture webinar about advancing microbial uh, bioproduction. Uh, my name is uh, Geoffroy Malherbe. I'm uh, part of Thermo Fisher Scientific. And uh, let me take you through the, the agenda of, uh, of today's webinar. So after this short introduction, um, you're going to get the opportunity to learn about various advances uh, in the area of uh, microbial-based biomanufacturing, starting with uh, some case studies in the area of uh, culture media and in particular peptones. Uh, then we'll have a, a presentation about uh, advances in the uh, automation of uh, microbial fermenters. Uh, followed by uh, an insight into uh, the first purpose-built platform for large-scale single-use fermentation. And we will follow with uh, some uh, comments and innovations related to the downstream purification of, of microbial-made biologics. And in order to introduce the topic, I'll give you a few general words about um, microbial bioproduction and also about um, brief introduction about our organization uh, before moving on to the next speakers. Right, so obviously uh, microbial fermentation uh, in itself is, uh, is obviously nothing new. It's uh, actually older than mankind and, um, and yeah, it's, it has a history which, uh, which counts in, in millennia from the perspective of, of human use of it. And it's only been about 140 years that it's become uh, a really controlled uh, technology since uh, the since the age of, of Louis Pasteur, more or less. And uh, today, it really has become one of the major ways to efficiently make biologics uh, and uh, make them in a in a way that uh, that needs to improve constantly to cope with uh, the various uh, constraints of uh, of biomanufacturing. So um, the applications range, as you can see, uh, from uh, plasmids uh, to vaccines and a, a number of recombinant products and, and further applications. And indeed, as part of the biomanufacturing world, uh, it's pushed by a very strong wave of, of technology innovation to, to deal with uh, new challenges uh, related to uh, large-scale biomanufacturing and single-use biomanufacturing. Uh, becoming a very fast-growing uh, industry. And in, in that industry, uh, Thermo Fisher Scientific really is the world leader in serving science with a number of, of division specialties and, and expertise to help you successfully uh, solve the issues that you have to solve and, and manufacture what you're aiming at, uh, at manufacturing. Um, we are part of the, the bioproduction division, which is one of the the divisions of Thermo Fisher Scientific that enables our customers to make the world in particular healthier and as well uh, cleaner and, and, and safer. So what we do in our bioproduction division really is all down to all the tools, technologies, services, and know-how that makes it possible for you uh, to, to make the biologics that you require, uh, all the way from uh, microbial uh, culture uh, to bulk storage and final fill until we hand it over sometimes uh, to some of our colleagues for further aspects such as clinical trial management, uh, for, for example. Um, the way we like to innovate is really summarized uh, in that bioprocessing by design wheel that you see on the right hand side, which is based on some fundamental aspects uh, such as uh, adaptive innovation as well as open architecture. So you will see all the flexibility and freedom which is associated to those technologies. So as a matter of closing the introduction, uh, what can a state-of-the-art uh, microbial uh, production line uh, look like? Um, that's what it can look like with the associated technologies from benchtop uh, all the way to 300 liter scale in, in single use and downstream uh, purification uh, that uh, microbial bioproduction has become possible. And with that, it's uh, my pleasure to hand it over to uh, our first technical presenter, who is uh, Céline Martin, 
uh, one of our cell culture experts uh, who is going to take you through a few case, case studies in uh, the area of uh, successful uh, peptone implementation in microbial bear production. Thank you, Joffre. Uh, hi, everybody. Thank you for listening in. Um, as Joffre introduced me, my name is Celine Martin, and I'm a field application specialist for GEPCO. And I will be presenting today on the use of our peptones for microbial applications. GIPCO is really well known for cell culture region in the mammalian cell, um, but now with the acquisition from advanced bioprocessing, DISCO and Bacto supplements are also part of this portfolio. So DISCO has a long history of developing products for microbial application. It started as a company in 1895, and at the time, DISCO developed peptones to do microbial water testing. Since then, DISCO has specialized itself in biotherapeutic application and is now supporting the production of more than 150 molecules for both human and animal health. So because we are focusing on the biopharmaceutical use of peptones, consistency and innovation are the main goals for all our development. But let me start with what is exactly a peptone. So peptone, or hydrolysates, as they are also called, are partially digested mixture of a natural material. The source of these materials can be animal, plants, or yeast. This material will be digested chemically or enzymatically to create the peptone. As you see on the figure on the right, the peptone obtained as a result are a complex mix of many components, including short peptides, single amino acid, carbohydrates, salts, trace metal, vitamins, and organic acid. Depending on the source of the material, animal, plant, or yeast, this, pro this profile will vary and be different. For microbial use of peptone, um, they are mostly supporting the nutrient requirements of the bacteria or yeast. The peptone that fits can be found for all strain and species, and they use them to increase biomass and yield compared to using a minimal media alone. As a minimal, microbial culture all need a source of carbon, nitrogen, phosphate, and sulfur all of those being provided and readily available for consumption within the peptone. Peptones are used to supplement minimal media and usually require an additional source of carbon and nitrogen. In standard microbial media, TB for peripheric growth or LB for Luria Bethany growth can contain up to 35 grams per liter of animal and yeast extract. In order to compare your CN ratio, we provide a set of typical profiles for each of our peptones in order for you to decide which one to screen and which one might fit your process the most. On the figure on the right, you can see the effects of using improved animal origin free peptones derived from soy or yeast compared to standard triptych soy growth. Some microorganisms also prefer blends of peptone. So it is ideal to execute a study where both pure and blended peptone are used. As further example, here you can see uh, below on the left, the different effects of plant peptones on E. coli and Bacillus subtilis. Growth, while used as a 1% supplement in M9 media. For E. coli or disco soy, uh, 100 performed a lot better than TSB, while for Bacillus subtilis, only a P-derived peptone managed to increase performance. As the train in microbial for therapeutic application is to move towards animal-free supplements to diminish safety risk, we have also developed an E. coli fermentation brooch, which does not contain any animal-derived peptone. As you can see on the right, this fermentation brooch is designed especially for E. coli, and it performs even better than TB, thanks to a blend of plant peptone. DISCO is also currently developing a fully chemically defined media for E. coli, which aims to be a complete peptone-free media that supports high biomass and productivity. As mentioned before, all these peptones are manufactured especially for bioproduction, which is why ensuring consistency and reducing lactulose variation is one of our requirements for developing a peptone. First, we are very stringent in validating our source of material, but even more importantly, we control each step of our, of our manufacturing process very tightly. So a typical manufacturing process for a peptone always starts with hydrolysis, which is also why they are called sometimes hydrolysates. At, at this step, controlling the degree of digestion, um, like um, while monitoring parameters such as time, pH, and temperature, 
are critical to ensure that the molecular weight profile of the peptone is always the same. The harvest gets them uh, to centrifugation, filtration, concentration, um, an optional step of ultrafiltration to reduce endotoxin level if necessary, and finally, spread drying and packaging. To develop this manufacturing process so it can be as robust as possible, DIFCO has developed a large capability in analytical testing, not only to qualify raw material, but also for lot release. For instance, we do not only look at pH or ash content, but also filtrability, solubility, or even performance assay. This specialized um, analysis are able to monitor each of the components that makes a pepton profile. We are thus able to characterize peptides, but also fatty acids or carbohydrates. These sets of assays are used to qualify new peptones to understand their composition and then validate our manufacturing process to reduce lot to lot viability as much as possible. We also partner with our customer to provide this deep understanding of peptone as a service. As an example of analytical support, one of our customers was using two peptones in their manufacturing to produce clostridium toxin. They had learned iron was critical for their process performance and iron concentration had to be controlled between 30 and 45 ppm. Iron is a natural element. It is usually present in most peptones. So to control that process, we use our analytical tools to follow trace metal and characterize yeast extract lots, but also different casein-derived peptones for them. On the left, you can see the lot, lot viability of the yeast extract. Iron concentration is consistently in their target range for this process. Then we look at different casein-derived products on the right. Here it is the same source, all deriving from cow milk, but the processing of the raw material is different. And as example, casamino acid, uh, which is the peptone with the highest level of digestion amongst all of them, was also identified as being entirely deplete, depleted in iron, which made this mix of yeast extract and casamino acid the best solution to reduce process viability for this specific toxin manufacturing. So that was a good example on how to ensure robustness. The first part is to qualify a supplier for which lot to lot consistency is a focus, but on the other hand, understanding of how the process can be influenced is also key, which is why there are three pillars to choosing a peptone. First is to screen several types. Secondly is to blend them to find the optimal mix. And then um, the final step is to titrate in order, in order to find the right concentration. In that perspective, I will now briefly introduce the large library Zivco has and of which you can pick from. Here is the list of animal origin free supplements we offer. Uh, most of them are derived from soy or yeast, but they are slightly different in their profile, notably in terms of carbohydrates and nitrogen content. These are very versatile peptones and can support many microbial cell lines. As example, if we look at ultrafiltered disco yeast extract, it supports quite well E. coli and Saccharomyces cerevisiae growth. We discussed molecular weight profile before. Here there is an example of a high degree of digestion with almost no peptide over 5 kilodalton. Then, if we look at animal origin peptone, there is also a large library to choose from as well. These are mostly derived from beef extract, pork, or milk. Some of them are already blended with soy or yeast extract, like triptychase or biosafe peptone. If animal origin is not a concern for your process, this type of peptone have a large compatibility range with a lot of different strains. As an example, if we compare on the same species as previously discussed, the Bactoprotease peptone 3, or PP3, which is derived from pork, supports the growth of Staphylococcus aureus, or Bacillus subtilis, better than yeast extract in this specific condition. You also see on the left that the molecular weight profile is quite different with this peptone, it being a lot richer in longer chain peptides. So to make it easy for you to screen our library of peptones, DIFCO offers different starter packs with up to six different types of peptone within each pack. That allows you to screen, blend, and titrate the perfect mix for your process. For microbial culture, starter pack two and three are the most useful and contain either only animal origin-free or a mix of both types of peptones. 
we have also a preview pack to test our newest peptones where we use new raw materials like wheat or cotton or alternative profiles for yeast or soy peptone. And for this preview pack, as we have seen multiple times before now, responses and culture can be widely different depending on the species. Finally, at a quick conclusion, Disco Peptone are now part of Gepco. Uh, both companies are very well established brands that have been supporting life, life science and bioprocesses for a long time by demonstrating reliable performance over and over again. If you wish to test our peptones, feel free to reach out and we will be happy to support you in screening, blending, and titrating to get the best out, yield out, out of your process. Hello, everybody, and uh, thanks for uh, listening to me uh, during this webinar. My name is Anthony Perret, I, and I am in charge in, of the bioprocessing equipment and automation for Southwest Europe in some official bioproduction. For the next five minutes, I will have the chance and the challenge to go through our scalable and flexible equipment and automation solutions for benchtop on the left to manufacturing fermentation on the right. As you probably know, some official, thanks to Finesse Inc. acquisition in 2017, is able to offer you a modular and disruptive solution for your fermentation process. Our bottom process layer is a kingdom of plug and play and single use smart components, such as mass flow controllers, valves, pumps, and sensors. Our middle process control layer is made of universal controllers whose open architecture will bring efficiency and flexibility all along your workshop evolution. The top IT layer offers a lot of possibilities that we'll show later. Our product line is covering the overall process flow from R&D, pilot to manufacturing plant. We are offering a pre-configured solution developed by our process and software engineers to meet the requirements and specificities of your process. This does not require further additional on-site programmation and offers a limitless flexibility. Our benchtop fermenters is composed of four sizes from 300 milliliters to 10 liter working volume. A complete range of accessories will address all your needs, including heating, cooling, sparging, and agitation. Many additional options are proposed, such as exhaust gaze measurement. These glass vessels will be connected to an IO station, also called G3 Lab Universal Controller. It's able to control either a glass vessel or a single-use fermenter. This really open architecture also offers the connectivity to various single-use and reusable vessels from the market. In order to support you for later stages of your drug development, the same principle of universality is also possible with our G3 Pro Universal I.O. station, able to control a pilot or a production fer uh, fermenter, also a bioreactor or a mixer, all along the life of your workshop. Please be patient. My colleague Melanie will present you uh, our single-use fermenter in a few minutes. Please don't be frightened, frightened by this uh, slide showing the limitless possibility of our architecture. Please focus on the top left black rectangle, which represents the distributed control system that we selected for its robustness and security for your sensible process. This DCS is the brain which will control all of your process equipment and even more. Of course, we'll select the best IT solution to embrace your project. Of course, no process control is possible without a process software. Our TrueBio will offer you a limitless possibility of fermentation strategies not only for R&D, but also for ma manufacturing. 
And because we can use the same process control strategy for the filtration or for chromatography skills in your downstream workflow and workshop, of course, we developed a suite of two softwares dedicated to chromatography and filtration skid driven from the skids touchscreen or from the IT room supervision. And last but not the least, depending on your project, our solution can integrate a manufacturing execution system. This layer of automation will aggregate the information from your ERP, such as quality documents, resources, consumables, and raw materials. That's the way to digitalization, interoperability of Industry 4.0, which is the future. So do not hesitate to ask questions or contact me offline. Thanks a lot. And let me now present you Melanie, who will present you our single-use workflow. So thank you, Anthony, introducing me already. So welcome to my presentation, um, Applying Single-Use Technology to Fermentation. First of all, I would like to give a brief overview of um, what I would like to dis discuss today. So why fermentation is key for biopharmaceutical market? The next, um, how did we develop our single-use fermenter? And in the end, a small wrap-up. Before um, we start the discussion, um, I would like to introduce the definition of fermentation. The original understanding is the anaerobic conversion of sugar to carbon dioxide and alcohol by yeast. So the most known product is beer or bread. Um, but today, if we talk about fermentation, we understand the aerobic cultivation of microorganisms. Um, and that's the definition we use in this presentation. First, um, I asked myself, is fermentation used for large-scale biopharmaceutical products? And why is it key for the market? And Yes, large-scale fermentation is still very important. Since recombinant products produced in microbial cells reached approximately $50 million billion, this is roughly one-third of the total sales of biopharmaceuticals. As you can see, the figure below, adopted from Wells in 2014, 35% of the manufacturing is done in mammalian show cells, but 90% is I use the cumulative numbers, is done in E. coli cells. Um, and the usage of other mammalian cells with roughly 60% is almost equal to the usage of yeast cells. If we have a look on the 20 top selling blockbusters from 2017, um, five are done by fermentation. The three types of insulins are produced in E. coli, Pichia pastoris, or Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And the two growth factors are both produced in E. coli. Um, next, um, I would like to have a deeper look on what is driving the market. So some patents have expired. Um, biosimilars and biobetters are in development and already in the market. So biobetters, these are biopharmaceuticals which are already in the market, but now altered in some way, for example, a structural modification or an altered finished product combination or formulation to improve some aspect of its clinical performance. This has been done so far for novel insulin formulations or combinations, as well as clotting factors with extended half-life. But for regulatory aspects, a biobetter is a new product. Um, another um, important driver is the rising healthcare costs and population aging. To overcome this issue, biosimilars are introduced. An example is an insulin produced by the Indian company Biochem, which has one of the largest global biosimilars portfolio, spanning from recombinant human insulin, insulin analogs, monoclonal antibodies, and other biologics 
for diabetes, oncology, and immunology. Along with its part of Milan, Biocon received approval from the European Commission in 2018 to sell the insulin produced in Piche Pastores in all 28 EU member states. And uh, Paulette et al. described 2016 uh, a simplified and efficient process for insulin production in Piche Pastores, where they describe how the usage of PCA reduced cost and time. So there are several high value proteins um, and therapeutics manufactured through fermentation. So we, as Jeff already mentioned, we have anti-cancer, cytotoxic drugs, vaccines. We have antibody fragments, non-glycosylated antibodies, ligands for chromatography, and diagnostic and molecular biology. Um, as you know, our from form of fermenters coming um, enzymes. And fermentation is preferred to cell culture when proteins do not require glycosylation. If you have a look at the growth characteristics of microbial and mammalian cells, we have a generation time from 20 minutes to hours in microbial cells and hours to days in mammalian cells. And this, of course, leads to a batch time of one to four days compared to 10 to 4 days. Um, in fermentation, protein sizes up to 15 gram per liter can be achieved. In mammalian, only 5 gram per liter. Um, in addition, the media costs are in general low for microbial cells and high for mammalian. Um, since microbes are more robust, uh, the growth sensitivity is low, um, whereas mammalian cells are more sensitive. Um, the glycosylation and the post translation modification issues, so wrong or not fully formed, um, can be overcome nowadays, for example, with Pichia Pastoris platform from Pichia Glycoswitch. This platform enables the production of proteins with controlled human like glycosylation. Um, the next important topic I, will, I introduce is how did we develop our single use fermenter? And before um, I will answer this question, um, there are several benefits of single-use technology in general, such as the decreased uh, risk of cross-contamination, reduced global manufacturing costs, the request for flexible bioprocessing equipment and less floor space, the different and the less validation needs, the adaption to batch volume, and last but not least, the security for BSL2 and more. However, uh, there are differences between mammalian and microbial cultures regarding process and variants. You can compare the cell culture and fermentation with being in almost empty New York Times Square in the early morning for cell culture and a very crowded late in the evening New York Times Square for microbial fermentation. So to remember, what are the requests for cell culture? Um, we have uh, low shear resistance of cells, so they need a gentle mixing. And we have a KLO of less than 20 per hour is achieved for O2 transfer. So what are the requests for the aggressive aerobic microbial cultures? We have high oxygen mass transfer, powerful mixing, in addition cooling, improved exhaust management, and foam management. So it's obvious that retrofitting of conventional cell culture single spare reactors is insufficient for microbial fermentation. So now I would like to show you um, how does our single use fermenter look like. Um, you can see the condenser and the high flow exhaust system on the top we have fully coupled drive mixing, center of high vertical shaft, three Russian impellers, and buffers. The bed loading door um, is there. We have volume indications and a liquid side window. We have a three, eight inch dimple water jacket on bottom and sidewalls. In addition, we have the cable management tree and the bottle support. We offer load cell and a swill lock casters. And they have square base open frame for easy access to harvest. So this single use fermenter platform is designed to meet unique microbial fermentation requirements that 
instead of being modified from a single-use bioreactor. So what were the thoughts behind the mixing development? There is a direct central mechanical agitation to bring in more power. The three Russian impellers, which generate high mixing, multiply impeller, increase in mixing distribution, um, all the Russian turbine impellers, impeller diameters is one third of the vessel diameter. Then we have radian mixing near impeller and exit space impellers cover axial mixing. The sub is equipped with four buffers, uh, which breaks up vortex of center drift mixer. And the design allows power for mixing with the PIV of 2.27 watt per liter and agitation rate of 600 RPM in the 30 liter and 375 RPM in the 300 liter. And there are vessel geometric proportion to mimic stainless steel design. The single use fermenter is also optimized for high oxygen mass transfer since fermentation process um, demands uh, uh, KLR above 400 per hour during rapid microbial growth without O2 supplement. Achieving a proper balance requires maintaining KLA, agitation, and gas fluoride with modest limits. As shown in the figures, you need to find the sweet spot between aeration and agitation. So how to increase the KLA? You have to work on the oxygen transfer rate, control the gas flow rate to control the number of bubbles, control the bubble size to control the resistance time and shear stress, and keep foam operation. Um, a further development from our side to achieve high oxygen mass transfer is a drill hole sparger. Um, the film space sparger disc with laser drill pores of specific hole size, and this creates specific uniform macro bubbles. So 25 pores with a pore diameter of 1 pound 575 millimeters. This produces constant bubble size regardless of the gas flow delivered to the bioreactor and achieves consistent performance better process scaling and reduced foam generation. Another crucial topic in fermentation is the thermal transfer, so heating and cooling. But why? Since the rapid cell growth and the metabolism generates heat, the temperature needs to be controlled to maximize productivity. Rapid temperature shift for heat shock introduction, um, this is a typical experiment, and we have a similar use back impact heat change compared to traditional stainless steel vessels. How can this be achieved? By working on the design of the fermenter. So we have the aspect ratio, so the high to diameter ratio. So this is like traditional three to one for high performance in your fermenter. We have a tall and thin vessel to give the possible surface exchange. And we have the temperature jacket to uh, eliminate liquid restriction. Um, in fermentation, aeration gas flow rates are higher than in single-use bioreactors. So this needs improved exhaust uh, systems. So we have this new exhaust system. This uh, film chamber replaces the cartridge housing. The film built onto a round filter using the entire cartridge diameter for exhaust gas and increasing the radius of exhaust pass from 0.5 inch to 1.5 inch provides a ninefold increase. So we have more than ninefold improvement in exhaust capacity. As you all know, um, BPCA has lower limit in back pressure um, than uh, condensate particles could block the vent filters. Um, and to overcome this, we've developed a condenser. Um, and this is important as a story in connection with vent filters, heaters, to prevent liquids and solids from condensing and collecting inside of the vent filters. Cools the exhaust gases, leaving the single fermenter chamber, condenses the moisture of the saturated gases coming from the single fermenter. So the condensators are returned to the bioprocess container 
creating a sterile loop and significantly reducing the liquid loss due to evaporation. Another well-known challenge in fermentation is foaming. And uh, foam, as you all know, foam could block vent filter and paint airflow and have an impact on certain strains, a negative impact. So um, that's why uh, we have developed um, our single-use foam sensor. This detects foam level in the BPC um, and automatically trigger addition of anti-foaming. So this may need for sure a specific configuration of controller. This, our single-use foam sensor consists of a 316 stainless steel anode suspended from a nitinol wire. And the grounding insert is set into RTD and connected to the foam sensor and controller. The controller measures electricity conducted from the sensor to the ground. When the foam touches in the sensor, drop in voltage detected, and this is addition of the anti foaming um, agent. Last but not least, uh, it needs a proper design of a single use bag. So, to have a, the, we have the chamber, and this is the validation constructed of the industry leading option of our Thermo Scientific CX514 or AG514 film. This provides you with the highest level of integrity and purity. Um, th this eliminates the possibility of contamination from previous culture and residuals. We offer you the gamma irradiated single use fermenter, and this eliminates the need for cleaning. And important to know for you, we can customize your bag for you. We can do customizations on port locations, line sets, sensor configuration, and the impeller. So the position of uh, and the number of impeller. For sure, we have done different testing to prove the design for complex fermentations. One study was the scale up and the tech transfer from a 100 liter sip and sip vessel to the 300 liter single fermenter. Um, a collaborative study with a new customer um, was undertaken with the objective of taking an existing uh, smaller preclinical E. coli process um, previously performed in a stainless steel vessel and scaling it up in our 300 liter single fermenter. So the tech transfer for the 30 liter and the scale up to the 300 liter stuff were successful and showed the same growth characteristics and high product yield can be achieved. So the product heat titer was roughly about eight grams per liter in each of the cases. Um, another uh, study was the mass transfer of single fermenters to third class biotests um, a comparison of uh, KLAs and in steel and steel and single use. Um, and as already mentioned, um, the development of the single fermenter has been purposefully engineered um, to best match traditional tank reactors. However, um, due to implementation of single use film for sparge and agitation, um, there can be limitations when moving aggressively growing dense cultures from steel tanks to single-use reactors. Um, to characterize the limitation of available single-use BI reactors, a rigorous comparison was undertaken for a Dikema status paper in collaboration with multiple vendors. Um, the 30 liter staff outperformed all the other single-use reactors of 50 liters or less, and the 300 liter staff outperformed all but one, of the thing use reactors of larger than 50 liters, or so, um, that reactor was of lower volume. So this testing confirms our Intel KLA testing, which shows scalability of the thing use fermenter for fermentation process to, uh, from benchtop reactors. We also tested different organisms and products to prove our design for complex fermentations. The main important microbial uh, platform is E. coli. Therefore, we have done different runs. So we have done for soluble, soluble DNA modifying enzymes, difficult to fold proteins, plasmid DNA production, thermoinducible recombinant protein synthesis. 
We have done also protein secretion by bacillus subtilis, um, protein IgG ligand production. And uh, last but not least, we have done a protein secretion by Pichia pastoris and Saccharomyces cerevisiae yeast. For example, the production of alkaline phosphatase and single chain antibody fragments. As shown in the graph on the right hand side, um, it was also possible to achieve even high cell density PCR cultures, which demands high oxygen transfer and mixing. So, to conclude, um, modified thing use biotas don't deliver performances for aerobic fermentation processes. Therefore, we developed our thing use fermenter that is based on proven principles of microbial fermentation. Um, fundamental engineering principles of physical geometries and the design criteria of traditional stainless steel vessels. Um, in addition, the single fermenter has been developed for complex aerobic microethnic cultures. Um, the hands-on side of the single fermenter preparation process is much shorter. You don't, you don't have to clean your reactor. Um, the vessel assemblies are there and you can reach Kalo up to 600 per hour. So with that, um, I would like to thank you and hand over to my colleague, Sojan. Thank you, Melanie. Uh, hello, everyone, uh, and thank you for your time and interest. My name is Zoltan Guyash, and I'm the field application specialist for purification at Thermo Fisher Scientific. We at Thermo Fisher Scientific can cover the entire bioproduction workflow and uh, now I would like to talk about the purification portfolio. We have two resin families that are complementing each other nicely. The porous resins with ion exchange and hydrophobic interaction surface chemistries offer a combination of high capacity, high resolution and high productivity. They are ideal candidates for both non-affinity capture and polishing applications. These resins are developed and manufactured in Bedford, Massachusetts in the US. The Capture Select resin family is a large portfolio of affinity resins for antibodies, proteins, and viral vectors, enabling high purity and recovery in a single step. This also enables a platform purification approach for the mentioned targets. These resins are developed and manufactured in the Netherlands. Both of these resin families offer GMP compliant resins and they are already used in many late phase and commercial processes. Both production brands are able to produce high resin quantities. The capture select ligand can be produced in up to uh, 15,000 liter fermentation scale and the porous resins uh, up to 250 liter volume scale. Both themes uh, offer custom solutions if none of the um, of the shelf products would fulfill your expectations and needs. The Capture Select technology uses the LAMAs and their unique heavy chain only antibodies called the Camelid IGs. These antibodies have the same specificity as the standard IGs, but the IgGs, but the variable regions have only heavy domains, which makes them simpler and more stable. The variable region of these camelid IGs will become the ligand on the resin, which is then immobilized to agarose and porous base beads. The workflow itself uh, starts with hundreds of different uh, ligand candidates, and we use a high throughput screening based method to find the best performing one. We screen for uh, specificity, but also for my dilution conditions and ligand stability. The genetic code of the final candidate is then put into yeast and the ligands are produced in an animal origin free manufacturing process using Saharomyces cerevisiae. We have been using this workflow for more than 10 years now and many of our products are used in commercial processes. The technology itself is proven and accepted by the quality and regulatory bodies. The portfolio slide highlights the three main areas we are developing resins for. These are the recombinant proteins and enzymes, the antibody and antibody related products, and the viral vectors. The bioprocess grade is the highest level we can achieve and we can offer. These resins have the CGMP grade, but the uh, research use only product portfolio is also available off the shelf. If the interest is there, these resins can be upgraded to CGM, CGMP grade resin as well. 
but we usually need a customer collaboration for this because we don't have access to these unique feed streams to perform the work on our own. A few examples, resin examples for microbial-made products. On the left-hand side, you can see the human growth hormone. Um, this molecule can be produced in E. coli, and we know about a few companies evaluating this uh, capture select human growth hormone resin compared to the older legacy processes that usually use a lot of steps to achieve the required purity. Another example is uh, the Kappa XP and CH1XL resins in the middle. Uh, these are excellent fab fragment purification solutions, um, and we know that uh, these fragments are sometimes produced in E. coli. A few additional details on these resins. The CH1XL uh, binds the heavy chain one domain of the variable region, and uh, it can be considered as an ideal fab purification tool because it does not bind the free light chains and light chain dimers, which are usually overexpressed in such processes. The next one, the Kappa XP, binds to the Kappa light chain of any antibody, and we could double the binding capacity of the previous generation, which was the Kappa XL. My dilution conditions are also possible. This means that you can increase the pH up to five or six, uh, but you need to add some additives, in this case, uh, for example, magnesium chloride. The C-tag itself is a unique four amino acid tag that has to be expressed on the C-terminal end of the target protein. This is the only bottleneck uh, of this technique. The C-tag is able to provide much higher purity and higher yield compared to the HIS-tag because the customers can use a proper immunoaffinity resin called uh, Capture Select C-tag XL and compared to the less selective metal ion affinity for the HIS-tags. We have a collaboration with the Jenner Institute in the UK in the Malaria Vaccine Project, and the use of C-tag and the resin made the process commercially viable and enabled the production of their candidates for clinical trials. Since their vaccine is administered a few times in a lifetime and the immunogenicity results are also favorable, the regulatory bodies approve the presence of the tag on the final product. Therefore, um, the C-tag and the C-tag XL resin uh, is an excellent purification system for any protein-based vaccine project if the addition of C-tag onto the C-terminal end of the target is, is possible. This slide highlights the three main features of the porous resin, the other, other resin family that we can offer. The first is the material itself. Um, the porous resins are made of polystyrene divinyl benzene copolymer, which makes them rigid and incompressible. They also have robust physical and chemical stability. The former ensures the linear pressure flow curve, which you can see on the, on the left-hand side, and the use of high flow rates compared to the soft gel resin. If you have a soft gel resin, um, the beads will be compressed after you start to increase the flow rate, and this will induce an exponential back pressure increase. This is not present if you have a porous bead. The chemical stability of the beads is also important because it enables the use of harsh cleaning conditions, which is very much needed to achieve high cycle numbers and long resin lifetime. The pore structure is the second main attribute, the unique pore structure. Porous resins have a combination of macropores and micropores. The former enables uh, the less diffusion-limited, more convective mass transfer by unlocking the inner surface of the beads, and the latter provides high surface area for high capacities. The improved mass transfer behavior due to the large through pores makes the capacity and resolution less flow rate dependent, which is very important. The flow rate can be increased to 800 or even 1,000 centimeters per hour without uh, observing significant capacity and resolution loss. The final attribute uh, is the 50 micron average bead size and tight bead size distribution controlled in the manufacturing process. The 50 micron bead size provides superior resolution and excellent pressure flow characteristics at the same time. We offer cation exchangers, anion exchangers, and uh, hydrophobic interaction resins, or even reverse phase resins uh, uh, on porous beads. And uh, these techniques are very well uh, known and used in microbial, purific microbial product uh, purification. We have two strong cation exchangers, the porous HS and the XS. 
The latter is the second generation product which successfully combines high capacity, high resolution, and the resin is also sold around up to 100 or even 150 millimolar salt in the load material. With this attribute, you can uh, avoid the excessive dilution or the use of uh, any techniques such as UFDF step prior to the loading of the product onto the column. This Solteran behavior is also very beneficial if you have, um, if you have this resin in the capture step. The next slide explains our anion exchange portfolio. We have two weak and two strong anion exchangers. Um, we have the porous D is similar to the DEAE resins, but the minor difference in the ligand structure of GE to selectivity difference in many cases. DI has a mixed amine surface, which includes primary, secondary, and tertiary amine. And the HQ itself is created from the PI by quaternizing this already uh, 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 complex surface to 60%. With the presence of all four types of amines, uh, the HQ is not considered a standard Q resin. It has a mixed mode, weak and strong anion exchange functionality, and this results in unique selectivities, which can be both, uh, which can be leveraged both in a capture step or in a polishing step. The XQ uh, is similar to XS. Uh, it successfully combines the very, very high capacity, high resolution, and, uh, and it's also sold around up to uh, 15 millisiemens per centimeter. This resin is an ideal candidate for very fast flow-through polishing applications, but also an ideal candidate for, for a capture step. Finally, uh, we have three new HIC resins, the porous ethyl benzyl and benzyl ultra. And with these resins, we wanted to increase the available hydrophobicity range and add new tools into the purification toolbox rather than simply copying the existing resins and their hydrophobicities. The ethyl is the least hydrophobic one we offer and perhaps you can find on the market. The benzyl is among the most hydrophobic resins uh, you can get. And the benzyl ultra is the most hydrophobic one you can have on the market. Uh, this, this hydrophobicity also determines the mode of operation. So the ethyl was designed for bindelute applications with very high hydrophobic uh, molecules. The benzyl can be used both in flow-through and binder loop mode, depending on the hydrophobicity of the molecule. And the benzyl ultra was designed for flow-through applications, mainly for aggregate removal in under low soil conditions. And with that, I'd like to thank you for the attention and, and please do not hesitate to reach out to us if you have any questions or you would like to evaluate any of our resins. Thank you very much, uh, Zoltan. So uh, with uh, that purification presentation, it's time to, to open up for questions. So as you can see on the webinar interface, there is a space for you to type in your questions. And uh, we're going to get to those um, as soon as, uh, as we manage to go through them, solve them, and, uh, and have our specialist answer those questions. In the meantime, as uh, some of you are typing their own questions, I would like to really thank you for your attention. So wrapping up uh, before actually moving to the questions uh, today, uh, you've had the opportunity to learn about some of uh, the key ways to make your microbial bioprocessing more efficient and effective from um, uh, adequate uh, peptone supplementation and um, high quality um, raw material use uh, to increase the titer. Um, you have learned how to implement automation solutions which are totally universal at benchtop scale and all the way through production. You have learned how to scale up in single use technologies and become able to start uh, the next run of maybe another microbial strain, maybe two hours after having finished the previous one, which was unable, uh, which was unavailable to the microbial community only recently. And uh, finally, we browsed uh, some of the downstream purification technologies available uh, for you both following uh, affinity uh, approaches as well as ion exchange or, or HIC. We chose to focus on those technologies. There's far more tools in your toolbox with uh, Thermo Fisher as a microbial bioproducer. 
such as uh, molecular analytics for some key analyses, such as, for example, uh, residual host cell DNA, uh, but, but many other applications. Another important aspect um, is also the Prima uh, technology with uh, inline uh, mass spec analysis of uh, fermentation gases, which is a, a key fermentation piloting uh, technology, as well as uh, some of the Sorval technologies related to uh, initial clarification by centrifugation, and uh, the list would obviously be uh, be far too long. So we we hope you enjoyed um, this uh, this seminar, and we are. Uh, we will be very pleased uh, to support your application, so feel free to uh, visit uh, thermofisher.com or, or reach out uh, to the closest uh, member of Thermofisher Scientific for any further discussions and being led to our, our scientists. Thank you very much for your time, and now let's go through the questions which we received. So, thanks for the interesting questions. I would like to provide, um, so the first question we have is uh, for Celine on the peptone side. So the question is, I've been searching for info about CN ratios of peptones, animal and animal free. I was wondering if you could share with us some info about those numbers and the total organic carbon for each peptone. Okay, uh, hi, um, thank you for this question. So what we've done and uh, the results are available in our manual. Uh, so to provide you with guidelines about CN ratio, so we've performed a study on each of our peptones uh, to provide the typical amount of percentage of total nitrogen, percentage of amino nitrogen, and also the concentration of carbohydrates in milligrams per grams for each of the peptones. So I won't go uh, in detail into each of the difference between the peptones. Um, I'd be happy to send you a, a manual uh, so that you can have an ID. Um, just to address the overall question of animal versus animal free and, and provide a bit of background, so for animal peptones, the usual total carbohydrate uh, content can be between 6 and 60 milligrams per gram, whereas for animal origin free peptones, so coming from plants, um, it can be higher. So the lowest we have is at 8 milligrams per gram, and the highest can be up to 995 milligrams per gram. So carbohydrate value are quite uh, valuable between animal versus animal free, but also within the different spectrum we have, whether animal or animal free. Um, on the other side, because we're speaking about C and ratio, um, the total nitrogen content is quite stable. So for animal peptone, it can vary around about 15% of the uh, total um, percentage of the peptones, whereas for animal origin free peptone, this is rather um, around 10%, with the lowest one being at 0.3%. Um, as we provide these numbers for each of our peptone, I invite you to have a look and see uh, which ratio um, would fit your, your process the most. Okay. Thank you. I, I hope that answers the question. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Celine, for that, uh, for the answer. Uh, because we're we are just on time, I'd just like to take one more question. Um, so the other question is about the single-use fermenter. I guess it's phrased under SUB, but I guess it's a, it's a habit. It's probably related to the single-use fermenter. Uh, microbial fermenter that was uh, presented by uh, by Melanie. Uh, the question is, could you share with us some KLA values for your single-use fermenter? Melanie, thank can you, you take that question, please? Yes, thank you very much for the question. Um, as you say, right, uh, for powerful master cell performance, uh, so many aggressively growing uh, microbial cultures require system that can produce KLA exceeding 600 power um, as measured without supplementing oxygen. 
Um, and these high care lay values are achieved in the system by supporting gas flows of two PVM. Um, even in our production facility, uh, where we produce the enzymes uh, for all the things for micro, um, molecular biology in Vilnius, we are, could, could achieve oxygen transfer coefficient KLA greater than 360. Um, I hope this answers your question. Thank you very much. So, thanks very much, Milani, for for answering that extra question from uh, from the audience. Um, I think we need to we need to wrap up because uh, it's one past three CET. So it's time for us to to give uh, you know another round of of thanks uh, to all participants for their time today. Um, you can absolutely reach out to the speakers. So you must all have had access to the flyer of the event where obviously you can email the speakers with a first name, dot last name, at thermofisher.com, or reach out to your usual Thermo Fisher contact uh, to put you in touch with uh, the right people for your location. For any further questions, we hope you enjoyed and that it will support your projects and success. Thank you very much. This closes our webinar.